Okay, and our next presenter is Olga Belogolova, and she's going to talk to us about perception warfare and whole of society solutions. So, Olga, welcome, and you should have the floor. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm pretty ex excited to join the Club of Mad Scientists. That's really the reason I'm here. Um, uh, I'm Olga Belgalova, as you just said, and in my day job, um, I work as a policy manager at Facebook. Um, in the evenings, I moonlight as an adjunct professor at Georgetown, teaching a class called Lies and Disinformation, as Ben uh, mentioned at the beginning of this conference. Um, today, I'll be speaking to you in that capacity as a Georgetown professor, and so the ideas and views that I'm going to be sharing are my own and, um, and those um, associated um, with my work as a Georgetown professor. Uh, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is about perception warfare and perception hacking. Some people call it one or the other. Um, and how we as a society can work together across agencies, sectors, political and social divisions to address these problems. So the weaponization, the weaponized information environment and this research community is notoriously plagued by muddled technology like information operations, disinformation, misinformation, fake news, um, influence operations, and more. So when I talk about perception warfare here today, I'm not just talking about the weaponization of information, but actually the, rather the weaponization of our perception of it. Um, so um, did you have my slides, if you can um, uh, put them up? Great. Um, so uh, I'm going to go to slide two now. Great. Um, so I'm going to start today by telling you a bit of a story, um, and it's a story of the 2018 U.S. midterm elections. The lead up to the elections um, period was characterized by an important realization in society here in the United States and around the world um, and a broader understanding of foreign interference threats. Um, there were countless conferences, television appearances, political cartoons like the ones you see on this slide, research reports, congressional hearings, stories of whistleblowers coming forward from the now famous troll farm in St. Petersburg, Russia. And there was a, this was a time where everybody was talking about this problem. And that's, that's the sort of environment that we were getting into. So next slide. So days, weeks before the election itself, government officials warned of pervasive Russian efforts to disrupt the election, social media platform officials testified on the Hill um, and also kicked off dedicated war rooms to try to combat, um, you know, the, the interference that had been previously identified. Um, and we all got used to, as a society, seeing the internet research agency memes, like the ones on this slide, um, in pretty much every news story that we read. Next slide. So, bam. Bam. Um, the weekend just before the election, this guy um, uploaded a video on YouTube claiming to have quit the infamous troll farm and also claiming that he was coming forward as a whistleblower on their pre-election activities. He even contacted several disinformation reporters, researchers, seeing if they would bite. Now, this guy named Williams wasn't actually an unknown entity. His persona was well-developed ahead of the 2016 election. He and his alleged brother, Calvin, had previously developed personas on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, claiming to be from the U.S. and trying to reach African-American audiences. They were all removed and exposed by different social media platforms in 2017, but here he was. He was back. Next slide. So in the video, Williams claims that he had evidence of interference in the 2018 midterm election. And he showed instructional papers, like the ones you see here, uh, that he allegedly stole from the troll farm. His video was removed quite quickly from YouTube and Facebook um, and Twitter and other platforms, um, limited its distribution so that it couldn't be shared. Um, most reporters as well um, didn't really fall for this. Next slide. Then, on the eve of the election, a website claiming to be linked to the Internet Research Agency went live at usaira.ru. The website, um, which you can see a few screenshots of here, um, loudly proclaimed its connection to the troll farm and shouted at the reader, in all caps, citizens of the United States of America, your intelligence agencies are powerless. Despite all their efforts, we have thousands of accounts registered on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit spreading political propaganda. It went on and on to talk about how, you know, they had sort of duped all of us. So interestingly, the website went to no real lengths to obscure its relationship to the Internet Research Agency. In fact, it was registered 
to Azimut LLC, a company that had been indicted by the Justice Department in February of 2018, so earlier that year. Next slide. The next day, after the dramatic countdown of the website um, had expired, um, they had one at the bottom of the page, um, the content changed and openly listed Instagram account handles and claimed interference in specific congressional races. Facebook had already removed 30 Facebook accounts and 85 Instagram accounts the night before, thanks to a tip from US law enforcement. But the story here, and the reason I'm telling it, is why did these guys want to be found this time around? Why did they claim to have a wider reach and influence than they actually did? What was the point of making this such an overt operation? Next slide. Well, um, as I told you, um, we were pretty well primed for this particular kind of effort, right? We had spent basically two years fearing interference, and they tapped into that very fear. We had spent two years reading dramatic whistleblower accounts of former Troll Farm employees coming forward, and then... As we expected, Williams showed up and confirmed our suspicions. As NBC journalist Ben Collins called it at the time, this was a disinformation trap, and we fell right into it. This wasn't just weaponization of information, it was the weaponization of our fears about influence operations. So why does perception hacking actually work? First, because of our cognitive biases and fears. Threat actors, particularly ones that studied the human psyche and reflexive control since the Cold War, take advantage of those expectations. Second, our growing distrust of experts and institutions meant that the IRA website shouting that our intelligence agencies and social media companies were powerless to stop these efforts, we were primed to actually believe what they were saying. Third, um, and I'm a huge believer in open source research and verification skills, um, and I appreciate some of the, uh, the comments earlier from, from Dr. Johnson on, on forensic research as well. Um, as a former journalist, I'm a bit biased um, towards, towards open source research, um, but there's so much that the general public could have known and figured out through some basics, right? As an example, um, as we already discussed, the website registration information for that IRA website showed its overt links to an indicted company. If one looked closely at the Williams video um, and actually tried to pull the URLs from his alleged evidence that he was showing, um, an analysis of those URLs would show that those articles were actually not really widely shared and not by a cluster group of people. Finally, in that video itself, if you look very closely when it was still up for a brief period of time, he was clearly still in Russia. Um, it was evidenced by the Russian water bottle that was sitting right next to him in his kitchen um, uh, to his left and the Russian KFC bucket that's sitting right behind him in his very former Soviet looking kitchen. Finally, um, and this is more of a societal issue, um, perception hacking and influence operations work because they capitalize on existing societal divisions and are distrust of one another. In fact, one of the reasons the 2018 effort was not as effective as it could have been um, was because law enforcement and social media companies had open channels of communication with one another and had actually worked together to the disrupt these accounts and remove these videos before they could actually reach a wider audience. So we weren't so powerless after all. Next slide. So I recognize that this is the, the portion of the conference here today that we're talking about solutions. So um, uh, in recognizing that, let's talk about some of the solutions to some of these perception hacking problems that I identified. So in order to address some of our cognitive biases and shortcuts, there's been a lot of great research on this particular subject, some of which you've heard today and some of which you can go in, um, and do some researching about. Um, when looking back at this 2018 perception hacking effort in particular, one thing we could have done was to wonder why these actors were being so obvious and to think twice whether we were being duped. Luckily, a lot of journalists and others did just that. Human beings don't actually do these things naturally, but there are ways to train our minds to engage in critical thinking, introduce friction to move our thinking from fast to slow. A recent study from MIT researchers actually showed that participants in a study were more likely to think about accuracy of what they were sharing if they were prompted with accuracy nudges, as they call them, um, and asked what they thought of accuracy as a concept, evaluate accuracy of headlines, even not the specific ones that they were trying to share. In my own personal life, I find that um, when I ask my mother, where did you read this? Was this a reliable source? Um, it later prompts her to send me emails that say, start with, 
I promise this is coming from a reliable source and citing where it, she actually found it. So in a way, I've trained that you know, cognitive muscle there. Um, and I'm lucky as well because uh, in my family, it's not just me, but my sister is actually a cognitive scientist. So we're all, we're all um, running our own influence campaign at home. Next slide. So um, we talked about distrust in institutions. That's one of the reasons why these types of campaigns are successful. Um, our distrust of institutions and expertise is both the goal and the tool of threat actors in the influence space. To combat this, we need to rebuild trust in institutions, including elections, democracy, intelligence community, government agencies, social media platforms, and media organizations and journalism. If any of you spend any time on Twitter at all, um, you'll be familiar with an interesting and problematic phenomenon that people often joke about, but it's important to this discussion. One day on Twitter, everybody's an expert on the conflict in Syria. The next day, all those very same people are epidemiology experts. And the next day, all of these people seem to be disinformation experts. I appreciate that some people may actually be very impressive Renaissance individuals, but this isn't possible at scale. We can't be experts about everything, whether it's at conferences like these, in the boardroom, in the skiff, or on the news, we have to elevate, elevate experts, not pundits. And when we don't know what we're talking about, we have to defer to experts that know better than we do. Next slide. So in my time working as a researcher and investigator, uh, one of my biggest pet peeves um, was hearing claims of Russian interference without any evidence. One story I always recall and tell is when a research firm claiming to track disinformation and track these types of actors accused a Muslim woman of being a Russian troll because her Instagram handle was similar to that of an internet research agency handle on Twitter. Before verifying, this research firm had tweeted about their findings, um, called out that particular account, and it is likely that this woman actually fair, faced a fair bit of harassment after that. So it's easy to jump to conclusions about a person you disagree with online and call them a bot, or jump to conclusions that every set of coordinated activity is somehow a troll farm, um, as opposed to say, an activist organization. Um, but as the Russian proverb says, um, which means trust but verify. Next slide. So there are a lot of problems that can be merely solved by Googling. Um, as the joke so, uh, shows, um, when someone actually comes to you with a fairly obvious question, um, if you want to be kind of a troll of your own, you can send them a link um, to the Let Me Google That For You website, um, which conducts the search for them. What blows my mind is that we live in a world where we have an unprecedented amount of information at our fingertips. That leads to information overload, which threat actors take advantage of but it also gives us an amazing amount of information with which to verify if we know how to harness it. So as Dr. Johnson mentioned earlier, there are a number of forensic tools that maybe are not accessible to everyone, but we can all learn a little bit more about how to leverage the information that we have openly available to us. If you look at outfits like Bellingcat, you can see a collective of open source researchers um, that don't have access to classified information, um, but they were able to track a Buk missile traveling from Russia to Ukraine before it shot down the MH17 aircraft. There are a lot of great people working in the space of open source research and intelligence, journalists adapting these methods, and organizations like First Draft that are providing that kind of training to newsrooms and individuals. And also, um, they, they now have a website where they, they have basically open training for, for anyone who'd like to, to take it. Next slide. So this is a tough one, um, and I, it's tough because these are, you know, as the slide says, hard problems. Um, you know, as it was mentioned during the war game talk earlier, most of the campaigns we've seen um, capitalize on existing societal fissures like racial injustice, marriage equality, um, partisanship, culture wars, and more. Threat actors don't create these wedges, but they certainly take advantage of them. And so we have to, as a society, work on these difficult issues and disarm the currency of whataboutism um, that has been used since the days of Soviet active measures. Next slide. 
So one area that we've seen a lot of work being done um, in government and in the corporate world is the disruption and denial of these types of networks, from social media platforms taking down networks of inauthentic behavior globally and publicizing them, to service disruptions of these troll farms led by Cyber Command. Um, also the naming and shaming of those organizing and running this, these types of activities, um, like the indictments from the Justice Department, um, they can serve as a deterrent to other actors who might want to engage in the space as well. Um, but, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, and I'll say again, um, these mitigations can't actually work in isolation. We have to work, they have to work in conjunction with all the other mitigations we've discussed and without collaboration, uh, with, with the collaboration of all of these entities. Next slide. So um, speaking of collaboration, um, you know, industry collaboration among big platforms, small pa platforms is extremely important. So um, what Facebook, Twitter, Google, and other companies already, already do today is share um, networks that they find with one another so that the other investigators on other teams can find and expose those networks as well and disrupt their activities across a number of different platforms. There's a really good example of that from um, an operation that's been called um, Operation Secondary Infection. Um, and it's a network that was first identified by Facebook investigators in May of last year. Um, and this network interestingly cuts across a dozens of social platforms, um, including online forums and you know, big and small kinds of social media platforms. Um, the cool thing is that this network is actually studied by researchers at DFR Lab and Graphica who identified additional activity based on the TTPs and known patterns of these threat actors. And then sharing that happened across these different companies, big and small, um, led to the identification and disruption of this operation across the board. Um, so it's a really good story to tell um, and hopefully there will be more examples like that in the future. Um, the same collaboration needs to happen across government agencies. So there are teams working on these problems, um, as we've heard, across different government agencies. Um, there's um, the FBI's Countering Foreign Influence Task Force, um, CISA at DHS, Cyber Command, the State Department's Global Engagement Center, and a number of other agencies. But as with the companies, they need to be talking to one another, um, as Alex um, from the GEC mentioned um, in the previous talk. Uh, as a former journalist, I would be remiss not to mention the importance of journalism and media in this work. Uh, a great example of that is the investigation from Clarissa Ward um, and the CNN investigative team, which took place earlier this year, um, when they visited a troll farm posing as an NGO in Ghana. Um, this operation um, was linked by Facebook and Twitter to actors associated with the past activity of the Internet Research Agency as well. Um, and, you know, this is a really great example where journalists, researchers, social media companies, law enforcement all work together to identify, expose, and remove this network. Um, and the on-the-ground reporting from journalists was extremely helpful to exposing this network and explaining how it worked to the public. Um, and it was an amazing collaboration. Again, I hope more of this to come. Next slide. So my final record recommendation here is kind of my sappiest, gushiest one, um, because, uh, you know, this work can't be done merely by playing whack-a-mole. Um, you know, I've been on that side of things, and I recognize that it's important to disrupt and expose these networks, but, you know, we have to not only think about what we're trying to fight, but also what we're trying to protect and elevate, um, you know, whether it's the expertise that I mentioned earlier or, or something even bigger than that. Uh, and here I've got another story with which I want to, um, you know, sort of close my talk, which is um, a story from um, the summer I worked at the State Department um, on countering violent extremism. Um, it was in between years of graduate school, and I went to go see the Book of Mormon musical um, at the Kennedy Center that very same summer. So uh, for the uninitiated who haven't yet seen it, um, the premise of the musical Book of Mormon has two young and idealistic Mormon missionaries sent to a small village in Uganda. Um, and they're meant to share the Book of Mormon and attract converts to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, the villagers who are more concerned about disease, poverty, warlords, aren't very receptive to the messages and ideas that they're hearing from these two young missionaries. Um, and eventually what happens, you know, as, not to give it away to anyone who hasn't yet seen this, um, one of the missionaries um, who's pretty frustrated by the unsuccessful attempts to connect with these disaffected villagers, what he does, um, in part because he hasn't actually read the Mormon scriptures, he tries a different approach. 
he tailors often with much embellishment um, the, re the religion to the needs and concerns of the locals, whether it's the poverty issues that they're dealing with disease or warlords. He, he lies a little bit and he tells a story of why, you know, why this book is actually useful to the population that he's trying to reach. So what does this whole story about a musical have anything to do with what we're talking about here today? Um, well, um, I think that successful strategy is to counter violent extremism and to counter influence operations more broadly, um, have to address the underlying societal challenges um, that, um, you know, communities face. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, some of these divides and wedge issues are existing ones, and so they need to be addressed. Um, but there's also, you know, initiatives that need to restore meaning in the value system that we're trying to protect. Um, as a personal story, you know, my family came to the United States as refugees from the Soviet Union. And one of the reasons we came here is because we yearned for the values and um, ideals that this country espoused. So I think that any country organization trying to combat these operations has to think about what makes them vulnerable to these campaigns in the first place. And they also have to give people something more powerful to believe in. So uh, as Mad Men's Don Draper once said in a pitch to a potential client, if you don't like what is being said, change the conversation. Next slide. So in closing, um, what I wanted to, to say is that, um, you know, there's a lot of mitigations and ideas that we've discussed here. Um, I don't think that they are all of the ideas that are out there. There's so many wonderful ones we've heard today. Um, but, you know, as the title of this talk notes, um, and you can see from our discussion, um, we do need a whole of society approach because none of these proposals or mitigations can work in isolation. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, and and go from here. Okay, thank you, Olga. That was a great presentation. We've got plenty of time for questions, so please do use the Q&A button down on your toolbar to get those in. Um, so the first one, we've got one from uh, Rand. He says, suppose the Russians suddenly halted all of their efforts at campaigns against U.S. persons. Do you think that would result in a significant improvement to the pollution, or I assume he means a significant reduction in the pollution levels in the information environment? would it make much difference to the disinformation campaigns related to our upcoming elections? So I don't think so, unfortunately. Um, I think one of the trends that um, was highlighted by some of the previous speakers or even some of the questions that have been asked is that there is a domestic angle to a lot of these operations. Um, most of you know, the operations that social media platforms have identified um, over the last, um, you know, few years have actually been domestic ones, um, domestic in many different countries around the world where governments target their own populations um, or um, PR firms or disaffected um, groups of people, um, you know, come together and actually uh, push their own um, narratives um, and do so sometimes in a coordinated and inauthentic fashion. And so, and Unfortunately, I don't think that that, you know, first of all, you know, it's important to say that it's not just the Russians, right? Um, my area of focus and, and research has historically been in Russian actors, but um, as, as the audience here well knows, um, there are Iranian actors, um, Chinese actors, um, Saudi Arabian actors that engage in the space um, and, um, and can all use these types of tactics. And so um, we would be naive to think that, um, you know, if Russia um, stops that we would be sort of okay. Um, and, and as someone who, who does look at Russia and think about how these actors um, engage, if I were looking at what's happening in the United States, I would say, not really worth the bang for the buck. There's a lot of problems domestically that you can either amplify or you can just um, let them evolve on their own. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Joe Bogan. To what extent do you think an understanding of the cultural slash philosophical currents behind state and non-state disinformation campaigns is of use in countering and preempting them? And if so, how should this be integrated into efforts to counter disinfo? So can you repeat the question? I just want to make sure I'm getting it right. Sure. To what extent do you think an understanding of the cultural slash philosophical currents behind state and non-state disinformation campaigns is of use in countering and preempting them? And if so, how should this be integrated into efforts to counter disinformation? Thank you. 
So I think, I think it's really important. Um, you know, if you look at what some of these threat actors do is they have a pretty good understanding of, of culture. Um, they, they study, you know, if you look at some of the, the documents that had been leaked from the Internet Research Agency before, um, you know, before it became famous, uh, you know, a lot of them were um, analyzing the social fissures. They were little, you know, briefs about um, particular problematic issues that exist in, in um, American culture. Um, also, they targeted their own population. So um, they had briefs for um, the employees on Boris Nemtsov and um, opposition movement and some uh, and religion and some of the issues that are really important in Ukraine and in Russia. And so um, if adversaries are trying to understand culture, um, anyone trying to combat that those uh, adversaries should try to do the same. Our next question comes from our very own Marie Murphy. She says, does verifying accounts on social media seem to have a credibility effect or are people more likely to believe their friends slash next door neighbors on important and complex issues regardless of their expertise? So I think that, you know, one, one of the things that we've seen lately in particular with, um, you know, COVID-19 is that um, there has been some verification effort to try to um, elevate the voices of people who actually do have expertise in epidemiology and um, in, in coronavirus specifically. And um, I think that's helpful, um, but, you know, when people are already sort of primed to only listen to certain um, ideas and there is that distrust of expertise, that verification won't do much. Um, so yes, you know, all of the people in, um, in my bubble who are reporters and people who look at that check mark and, and think of it as something that means a lot, um, yes, it'll make a difference. Um, but I think for the average person, um, I think people do rely quite a bit on trusted sort of influencers in their own communities. And so I think um, some of the strategies I've previously heard, um, you know, related to that are, um, you know, actually, you know, targeting the influencers themselves because they have such a wide reach in their community, whether it's a religious community or something else. Um, you know, I think Finland has experimented a little bit with this um, where they actually um, wanted to elevate, um, you know, particular health guidance um, during the COVID-19 crisis. And they tried to do that through particular influencers in Finnish society. Um, so maybe, maybe that's another strategy to try to reach the silos that exist already. So this next question kind of relates to what you just said there and relates to the average citizen. Um, it's from Emil Prosko. The information overload that overwhelms most social media consumers also leads to a sense of helplessness, which enables the Russian information warfare strategy. The average person isn't likely to be aware of some of the legitimate fact-checking resources you mentioned, and because they're overwhelmed by uncertainty, may give up trying to seek them out. So how do we make the average citizen feel more empowered in their pursuit of truth, given all the threats discussed today? So there's a number of different things um, that, you know, first of all, individuals can and should do to try to, you know, learn more about what they can. Obviously, I understand that there's, um, you know, the overwhelming factor of information overload. Um, some things that social media companies and some of these researchers in cognitive science have proposed are, you know, more contextual clues. I think Cara talked about this earlier in terms of labels, um, other things where, um, where an individual can have more information around what they're seeing. Um, one of the things that um, happens on the internet is, um, people are stripped of the context that they usually have. Um, you know, even, even in sort of the forensics training that Bellingcat runs, um, if you look at a piece of a building, you don't actually know all the other things around it. And so um, things like labeling um, state-sponsored outlets, uh, which a number of social media companies have done, um, things like adding more contextual clues about, here's another story that you could read related to the subject. Um, as I mentioned earlier, introducing friction into the process where people um, may not be able to reshare something until they've read it or until um, they've at answered a few questions. It sort of forces people to, to um, improve their, their diet and add some more healthy vegetables to it. Great. Thank you, Olga. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions. Um, we've had a lot of great conversations today. Um, I particularly like the nudges part of your, um, of your presentation. I'm going to use that in the future. Uh, we thank you for presenting with us today. We thank you for coming on, and you are now an official Army mad scientist. Very excited about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely.